put it on the computer. Well, welcome everybody to our podcast today. I am so, so excited. I had the opportunity to meet Sue a few weeks ago at a chance meeting at an event that we were at. And the energy just connected so quickly between the two of us and the alignment and the work that we do, even though they're very different work, definitely there was a huge alignment. So join me in welcoming Sue Hornby. Hornby? Horning. 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 Yeah, with an ING. <laughs> yeah, Horning. Thank you. Well. That's and okay. Do you go by thank Sue you. as opposed to Susan, or do you go by sure. both? Both. Excellent. Um, and so I wanted you to really get an opportunity to speak to our audience today about your journey into your career and your businesses, because I see you have many businesses, you wear many hats. And yeah. for most of us going into the health and I'll just call it health and wellness, you may call it something different, feel free to tag it however you want. Um, there's a lot of angst or misunderstanding about what that really can mean to people. So mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what initially got you interested in this field that you're in. Um, well, thanks for asking. I appreciate your curiosity about it because I do think that my path has been really unconventional. It's not what it's not what everybody else is mm -hmm. doing for, by a long shot. Um, but it didn't start out that way. You know, I kind of have a conventional background. I went to Simon Fraser University. I have a business degree from there. Wow. And I graduated and I worked for a little while uh, for a real estate development company here in Vancouver called Morgard Investments. And then I uh, transferred out of there and I went to work for Placer Dome Gold Mining Corp. So I started out with a little bit of a corporate nine to five uh, mm -hmm. situation, which I uh, really had kind of aspired toward. Um, and then I got there and my father actually became ill and he died of a brain tumor very, very rapidly. So it was a geoblastoma multiform stage four tumor in the back of his brain right here. Oh, and so I had a very profound uh, change in my orientation when that happened. And I don't know if you've lost a parent, Sally, but a lot of people who do have uh, their parents pass on, um, we'll talk about kind of the, the effect that it can have on your life or the change that it has on mm. spiritually. And so I had a real spiritual experience um, when I watched my father from diagnosis until he passed. Um, I was very connected to my father and I had a very um, a big shift in my awareness or my understanding, my spiritual understanding. Mm -hmm. It actually prompted me to make some really big changes in my life. Um, and I opened the, I opened a yoga studio. I decided to follow my, uh, the path of one of my, uh, of some of my favorite people who were my, at the time, my yoga teachers. And I took their teacher training. Um, and I just started to want to be more involved in holistic communities. And I thought, mm -hmm. oh, is there a way that I could make more of a difference to my community? And when I opened the yoga studio, it cost me quite a bit to uh, renovate and to get started. And the company I was working for actually um, was bought out by another company, Barrett Gold, and they gave us all layoffs. And the amount of money that I had spent renovating the yoga studio was paid for by the gold mining company oh, nice. with a layout, with a very generous layoff. And so mm -hmm. I walked into my yoga studio free and clear. Nice. and opened and started serving and so when I think when you go also into that place of community service and I really just mm -hmm. felt that there was this orientation that I wanted to heal myself I wanted to heal other people I was living in a very fast-paced kind of um, time in my life and I wanted to slow down and do things a little differently and um, yeah, it just began with that and then of all you know I was there 15 years I closed in 2020 and I had so many incredible um, experiences with holistic professionals, um, people who um, are humanitarian and who are interested in community activities. A lot of people came and taught at my studio, um, not to mention the physical practices that I did, all the yoga, and purification things, and then my diet and things like that. And so it really just started to sink in that, um, that I could really make a difference um, in a care giving role. And so um, providing care for people, I think is, is not for everyone though. And I think, you know, for anybody who's starting out in and interested in getting into holistic services, I really wanna evaluate whether or not you're the type of person who really naturally is drawn to 
provide care for other people mm-hmm. um, because people are a difficult species. You know, after all my experience, I sort of got into this, <laughs> I sort of came to this awareness where it was like, wow, people really, people are really driven by their own uh, self-interest. You know, um, people are going to try and get things out um, before they're really putting things in. And so I really started to understand the deeper wisdom of, um, of the human condition and mm-hmm. sort of what it means to work with it. And I think that really spurred my curiosity in some of the holistic things that I've studied and and, um, worked with. One of them um, I work with is like a Chinese astrology. So I do this four pillars Chinese astrology, which is based on the the wheel or the compass of the Chinese Bagua. And it talks a lot about it. It uses the five elements as its foundation. And so discovering that really helped me with some of my personality things, things that were going on with my family and doing interpretive analysis of why people are the way they are, you know, what motivates certain people to do certain things and what makes people, you know, friendly or, you know, why people are the way they are. And I think that helped me come to certain truths about human beings and human nature that um, that has really helped um, set a foundation for some of the other work I've done. and then getting involved in, in relationships with people, you know, most of them in very platonic spiritual ways in community settings, you know, running yoga retreats or um, working with them over a number of days on retreat or working with them over just an hour of, with a five minute conversation um, and recognizing that there's different levels also to um, working with people, working in groups. Um, and then, you know, I started sell- uh, serving tea at the yoga studio. So it, was, it made sense. I had this yeah. extra space in the front of the yoga space to offer tea. And, you know, when I first started putting teas out, I put out black and green teas. And of course, the caffeinated teas, um, you know, you drink them and you just have all the, this like stimulant energy mm. in your nervous system, um, which sort of worked if you're doing a lot of vinyasa yoga and you want to do this power yoga, which I was really into in my twenties. <laughs> The caffeine <laughs> seemed to get me through a yoga class like nothing else. Um, but then I discovered, you know, you know, there's more subtle uh, teas like peppermint tea, which is also still stimulating, and maybe rooibos teas and other flavorful herbal teas. And so that was my, the beginning of my career with my herbalism is that I just mm. started drinking dried plant material and started reducing how much caffeine I was drinking and started to notice that my practice was transforming from this highly athletic as athletic based practice into a slower deeper quieter form um even meditation started to emerge um out of out of some of that and i think the tea kind of shifted my nervous system a little bit you know a change in what i was putting in my body a change in my drink a change in my diet um it started to transform slowly over many years transform um what was going on and I think the reason today why I'm an herbalist is because of that um, one herb skull cap, which seemed to calm me down and help me sleep at night because I was so high wired after mm-hmm. university and my corporate career yeah. and all this mm-hmm. achievement that I felt like I, I wasn't sleeping. I was kind of tired at night, but really wired, but young enough not to have it affect me too much. Mm-hmm. And then as I got into my thirties, I started to realize, Oh, like I was kind of burning out a little bit, you know? And the herbs were starting to work in a different way. So I started to experiment with some of them and just tasting teas and and pouring hot water and doing a little bit of research. I started to discover the nervous system trophy restoratives. And those herbs are really what kind of repair and regenerate uh, the nervous system from high cortisol or high stress. So not to mention the Siberian ginseng will get me through an athletic uh, an athletic <laughs> practice better than almost anything else I've found so you know so just starting to include the herbs um for myself yeah and then before I knew it of course people are asking me about herbs and then and then I started blending teas and making tasty blends and adding in rose and lavender and adding in ginseng and then I learned how to tincture herbs and now I've got like this huge now I've got a whole apothecary of all oh, wow. these plant medicines that I work with that's awesome <laughs> Look it's funny that. too yeah it's funny how it emerges and you just um I don't really even know it just kind of unfolds step by step mm-hmm. you know and I don't know if that was the same for you in your career but I just find that one thing kind of leads to another thing mm-hmm. and then you just progress in this step-by-step way yeah. um toward what is really inspiring and interesting and then mm-hmm. what's helpful you know 
uh, I think it's part of listening to your curiosity or I noticed in yeah. part of your the information that I found out about you is when you quiet the mind and ideas come, right? Um, and you're allowing energy to come through you and to you and come up with those ideas. And all of a sudden you're interested in something that, you know, has been sort of mulling around, but it's now coming up with the steps on what to do next. But I think it, you know, what you, what it is, and it's so deeply natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And it's, you know, because you have an interest in it, it naturally flowed. So it allowed you to share your wisdom with other people and they became interested and they probably also saw a difference in you right from yes your physical and to inspire yeah. yes and to inspire other people along that journey um I think the other really fortunate position that I was in is that I wasn't under anyone else's employ mm -hmm. and I think that's also something to consider you know people who are accustomed to being uh to having some limitation put on what they can do or what they can mm -hmm. um what they can work on. I mean, I had uh, the incredible fortune to have a lot of freedom over my day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. um, and I chose that actually, because partly because I had trouble with an 8.30 a.m. start. <laughs> like I appreciate Sally, we're meeting today at 1 p.m. But I had a, <laughs> I had a particularly, I had a particularly slow burn in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. Getting my fire lit in the morning. Yeah was something I always struggled with. I struggled with it as a teenager through my 20s, through my 30s, even now, sometimes still, um, although it's much, much better now that I've healed a lot of my adrenal um, mm -hmm. stuff or I'm working on my adrenal stuff because I think it is related. But I also think that, you know, sometimes our schedules, when they're clearly defined by other people, don't allow us the freedom to really explore what we do naturally or what we mm -hmm. do best or when we do it best. Yes. Um, you know, and as I started teaching yoga, I noticed there were times of day that I felt better teaching, like during the lunchtime when the energy was highest in the mm -hmm. day, I really found that was a good time for me to practice. And I found the evenings had a different quality. You know, I liked my meditation and something much gentler yin in the evenings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you start to also harness the natural rhythms our biorhythms, which I think we separate from sometimes when we have these strict um, regimented control mm -hmm. over our schedules yes. um, and, and even over our lives in general, you know, whether or not we have a lot of limitation on what we are able to do every day through financial limitations or, um, you know, responsibilities or these kinds of things. And so I think I've been really fortunate in that I didn't have a lot of those limits. And so I, I was able to actually grow freely in a way that maybe, I don't know, is hard for other people to grow into, or you have to really choose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is a choice. And, you know, I found mm -hmm. since I also lot left the corporate world in, I'm now in control of my, my day. There's times in my day where I just feel like I'm getting to that point where it's like, okay, this doesn't feel good anymore with what I'm doing. I'm either putting too much pressure or don't have the right kind of energy for the activity that I'm doing. And I say, okay, just go for a walk. Just go do your exercise. Just get out and fresh because air. Because you're moving enjoy. from a feeling. Mm -hmm. You're moving from a feeling place. You're exactly. like, actually, today has this feeling. And I don't know. I think the astrology helped me understand that as well. Because with a five, an understanding of the five elements, you recognize that certain days are good for certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, certain phases of our lives are good for certain things. You know, we can't be performing. We're not, you know, we're not hu human doings. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're human beings, but we can't always be accomplishing or always be productive or always be making money. I think there has to be an understanding that we have an elemental flow or like a changed, mm -hmm. a changing environment, a changing natural environment that dictates different things are possible at, at different times times and be sensitive to that I think is where your work is really powerful mm -hmm. because training the body to be sensitive to those natural ebbs and flows yes is hard to do and and maybe not possible for everyone I don't know maybe that would be something that we could talk about because I don't know is it possible for all of us to harness our intuition and to develop that sensitivity or is it something that is inherent within some people that they are capable of doing that what do you think I do think it's possible for everybody I think it's that we haven't been exposed to it because mm. of the schedules that we've been raised on since we were children right yeah. so we've always been in a schedule um, whether you know 
when I was little, it wasn't daycare, but with my son, it was right. And then it went yeah. straight to school and that schedule and doing the homework or doing the sports and everything was schedule, schedule, schedule. And likewise, when you said you walked out in the corporate world and this is what was expected. And then how many days did we push, push, push to get everything done late at night and, and so on. And so for me, I've come from that environment. I've come from that environment where I got so sick at the end of December from pushing for year end and working long, long days just for somebody else's good, <laughs> right? For the company's good, not for my good. And just caused myself to be so sick. And that's when I really realized I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to have that situation where my work is causing me to have illness. And so I, I made a choice. I made a choice to make a different decision for myself and my family. And I can tell you, I'll never look back. I'll never no. look back. Because I think too, it is a choice. And I think sometimes we're blind to the assumption that we have to make this choice. And I think that's where perhaps your work and your coaching, your mentorship can really help people see an, another potential, another possibility. And, you know, you, there may be things that it will cost you. Like, um, you know, I can't tell you, I never worry about money. I mean, you know, but there's also a, there's an offset, you know, I mean, when we're really striving to work for someone else and we have that stability with our finances, we know we're getting paid every two weeks and that money goes in there. There's a, there's a quality of safety that comes mm -hmm. along with that. And so for choosing that, because safety is really one of our main priorities and it's our goal to feel safe and to have this kind of reliability um, in our lives I mean that can be really important to some mm -hmm. people and so that's something that I had to work through as well where I thought okay like I have to actually cultivate more faith that I'm provided for yes. I have to be more confident in mm -hmm. that what I'm doing is the right path for me so that I'm not going to feel this sense of insecurity mm -hmm. or lack of safety lack. Yep. and so I think there's also you know, I think there's also a lot of that, particularly for women, if I could be so mm -hmm. bold and speak about women in that regard, because I think historically women have had to work uh, for their safety with men or mm -hmm. work for their safety so that they can provide for their offspring or there's there's sometimes an undercurrent of uh, feeling unsafe for a lot of women. And mm -hmm. so I think that can actually put some put a woman in a perpetual strive for that stability. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, overcoming that is not, is no small leap, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think for me, it's still a, it's still a constant uh, effort or a constant acknowledgement or awareness about my own issues around mm -hmm. my own safety. And that comes back to the work of faith, the work of hope and trust and Yes. Um, you yeah, know. The, the belief that you would have in yourself, but also the belief in that you're doing the right things to attract the people, opportunities, income to you, right? And we all have paradigms. And That's some right. of us have very strong paradigms. Almost all of us have very strong paradigms. And so part of the work that I do is really helping people to identify the ones that are, are holding them back. And almost everybody's paradigms go back to childhood. So they can be in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and their paradigms still relate around something that was either said or done in their childhood. And so we end up holding on to that and that feeling for so long that we don't, we give up our own belief in ourselves and the trust in ourselves to be able to move forward the way that we truly want to and to be able to release that negativity that we're holding because most of it's negativity. There's always something from there yes. that we're, we're holding on to. Um, and so it's become more and more prevalent in my practice to to see people coming in with ones that I'm just like, oh my goodness, this is just so common now. And but yet there's a there are simple ways to be able to help you to move past that to create the success and the confidence and the belief in yourself and, and have that faith that everything that you've ever wanted or desired is there for you. It's just waiting for you to show up. That's right. right, because I think creativity can't um, be birthed in infertile soil. And mm -hmm. so I think it comes back to the quality of our soil. You know, if I could even use that um, yeah. analogy, because I think the soil is our mindset, like, mm -hmm. you know, you're a mindset coach, the soil is our mindset, how we yeah. feel when we wake up in the morning, how we set up our own thought patterns, that's the mm -hmm. soil. 
and from that soil creativity is the is the seed you know mm-hmm. um and i think that what we want um what we desire in our life or what our heart yearns for is the is the plant mm-hmm. you know and and when we harvest that plant it's also this quality of like uh deservingness worthiness you know harvest or mm-hmm. we take for ourselves and there's a whole process around that and i think I think depending what life what life cycle we're in or what part of our lives we're in, those different parts of that cycle are are important because if we haven't had if we haven't had good soil mm-hmm. and we haven't seen if we haven't planted good seeds, we're not happy with the growth, then we're discontented because there's no harvest. And so everything really starts at the soil level. I mean, if yeah. we if we if we don't have that, well, well, what do we have? And I think that in that place where our garden isn't growing the way we want it to be, that's where our health is suffering. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at the plant or maybe at the external forces, the sunshine, government, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the, um, how much rain we've had or whatever. And we forget to look right underneath our feet and say, how is the quality of my soil, which is our heart and mind and Mm -hmm. how we use it, right? Spiritually. Mm-hmm. And I think it, for you, I think there's such a huge role now for spiritual teachings, because I think we are in a time, an age of maybe spiritual crisis, or if we don't transform what we've, we, we don't mm-hmm. transform our soil, we can't change the earth, we can't change ourselves, we can't change the planet. Yeah, right? I believe there's a big movement in that as well, where people are seeking out oh, yeah. the experts now, because they've got to the point where all of that noise, I'll call it, is not serving them. And they're realizing that. And now they're seeking people like yourself and myself to be able to support them in a new journey, in a yeah. new, new belief system, in a, a new understanding of themselves and their bodies and their minds. And that's where I'm really seeing the transformation starting to pop up. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, having someone else that believes in them. Yes. Right? So important. It's so important. Supporting the soil. I mean, yeah, we all need a little guidance in life, you mm-hmm. know, myself included. I can't tell you the number of wonderful mentors, teachers, healers, mm-hmm. companions, friends um, that have, you know, been around me. And despite the fact that human beings also have their challenges and human relationships can be really difficult, they're also our saving grace. You mm-hmm. know, we're not we're not here to walk the path alone. We're here to link arms with people who can cheer us on. And Mm. I was even talking to a girlfriend the other night about one of her relationships, you know, and she's at the end of a very long, hard uh, program in traditional Chinese medicine. And I said to her, I said, at this point, at the end of the marathon, you only need those people that are cheering you from the sidelines. You don't need anybody who's going to, you know, cause you any kind of stumbling, any kind of fail, any kind of energy cost at this stage. Mm is not what you need. You, and, and then I thought to myself, I thought, well, who cares if you're at the end of the marathon or you're at the beginning? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you just, <Yeah. laughs> it's the same. Then I've had this moment. I was like, we don't need people to trip us up ever. You never mm-hmm. really need somebody who's draining your energy or causing you obstacles, you mm-hmm. know, on your journey. We want the people that empower us to yes. be our best and take us forward. And I think women, I think women particularly, um, succeed when they when they have the right supports yeah 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 and and oftentimes we can resolve the things that we've got going on easily enough by having that support that's helping us to recenter right yes we center our mind we center our body and get us to the belief and just the energy level that we need to be in Um, yeah as I'm coaching people and working with people and they come to me and they're stressed out because they've got this big to-do list (laughs) I just say, well, you need to change it and add like just have two or three I get to do list as opposed to I have to do list. I get to. Yeah. yeah. But I said, yeah. if you're putting the wrong energy out with all of this work that you're doing, you're only going to be holding yourself back. So unless you actually have the right energy at that moment when you're doing whatever it is you do, then it's not going to serve you or give you the results that you're looking for. So you need to slow down. You need in fact, it makes it through. hard for people to find <laughs> you because if you're so anxious and neurotic about your to-do list, you're not really, you're not, you don't really have your head up ready to care for people. Yeah. And I think that's a huge teaching for anyone who wants to get into holistic care or caring for mm-hmm. others is that 
we cannot pour from an empty cup. Yeah. So if you're always bogged down with like what you have to get done in a day or, or other concerns and they slow you down, they're just, they're just going to get in the way of you being able to be there for, mm-hmm. for in the way that you want to be for others. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, I think the full, the full cup is, is all part and parcel to that, to the practice of coaching, to the practice of, um, you know, insightful things. And, you know, sometimes chemical, I mean, Sometimes I do come across people who really have a chemical problem or like Mm -hmm. a, you know, more severe underlying health condition. And I think when we come across illness, I think it is truly a call towards spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing more transformative spiritually than a threat to your health. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I learned that when my father was passing, I thought, wow, like here it is. He's lived his whole life worked really hard, saved his money, done all the right things. He was a professor of chemistry. And Mm -hmm. they think that the brain tumor had something to do with the chemical exposure. They used to wash down their benches with benzene. And so there was some indication that he had a chemical uh, toxicity Uh in his body that led to it. But there he was having a spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. So how we come to spiritual transformation can often be through this, uh, through a susceptibility to our own our own state of vulnerability where we recognize our mortality and and I think through that we can transform our understanding of what's meaningful mm-hmm. why life is meaningful yeah mm-hmm. and they you know I heard a speaker the other day and they were saying that as soon as somebody has a diagnosis the energy that they put toward it and the attention that they put toward it just expedites the speed in which this diagnosis grows Right. So if you think of it from that perspective, it's like, how many times do you, you don't even know what's going on. Sometimes you go to the doctor, you think, you know, something's up, but you don't know what you get a diagnosis and all of a sudden, boom, you're in the hospital, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. And then you add in the burden of medications, Mm -hmm. which we're starting to see now that is a burden on the body. So we have already a body that's ailing. And then we add in a burden, some medication. So mm-hmm. we put something in there that, that creates a, a, more of a challenge on the organ systems. And yeah, I think, I think, you know, sickness management can bring us back from an acute something, but I think only holistic health and wellness can make us well, mm-hmm. you know, you're not going to get well under in sickness management care. I don't think, I, I mean, it's possible that you can, but I think, um, I think it's a, it's a separate uh, endeavor getting well versus healing Mm -hmm. from sickness a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I do go back to the soil analogy, you know, if the plant is not growing well, the plant is not thriving, you know, you have to look deep to the root, to the soil, Mm -hmm. to the seed. That happened to my garden when I was in Quebec. (laughs) They had had two containers on the land, on the, the lot that we had beside us. And they had moved the containers off. And I thought, well, that's a perfect area to make my garden. So I dug up all the roots and I spent days and days digging up these two big, huge lots. And then I bought new soil in, I had it shipped in and put it all in. I fertilized it, did everything and hardly anything grew. I was so devastated. I planted and planted, but nothing grew. And that's a perfect example when the soil Well, it is because that is the spiritual void. And so I think also that's about attachment to attachment to being well, attachment to thriving. You know, I mean, as we're not all of the nature to be well all the time. I mean, that's also, you know, letting go of our grasping for like mm-hmm. uh, perfection in the human form or the human body or uh, perfection of any kind, you know, sometimes no matter how much our efforts to be well, we cannot be well. Yes. You know, so I think that's a really beautiful thing to think about too, like that 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 spiritual mm-hmm. void where you know nothing grows and it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. really important in those moments is is the present moment and the experience mm-hmm. of being. You know. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the, mm-hmm. um, you know, the sounds like a lot of the work that you're doing, similar to mine, but in a little different fashion, is really on who are you. Like, who are you being in every moment of every day? And, you know, I have different ways of doing that than you do, but it's still the same result, right? Who are you choosing to be? 
And yes, and nature has this way of like showing me the way. Like I feel purposeful in what I'm doing, even though it's varied and it's diverse. That there's enough time in every day for all the things I need to do. Um, I, I like I like to say also, oh, that can happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, I, I can take two weeks off, I can take three weeks off, and it'll be fine. You know, and then what, to, what am I doing with that time is another is another question. Because when you start to get into like, doing what interests you every day, and you get to do all the things that you want to do in the day, you think about time off very, very differently. I don't know if you have that <laughs> time off is no longer this like, thing I'm striving for, unless there's some reason to take time off what I'm doing. I'm doing what I want to do. So time off changes. I mean, yeah, it absolutely know. does. Yeah. Um, and I just think it, be, it comes down to that choice, right? That choice that you have when you have your own yeah. opportunities that you've created to be able to serve others in a way that's going to allow them to be, we have to be, if we're not in mm. being who we need to be and our energy is zapped, it's not going to serve anybody. And so it's especially important for practitioners like us to be able to really make sure that we are listening to our minds, bodies, and spirits to be able to stay in that right energy of being. And because you can't give if you're drained, you just can't. And to have that continuity, um, I think has also been something I had to cultivate, like that continuity of stamina Mm -hmm. to maintain and sustain my offerings because I think what what I've seen happen with other providers, you know, is they hit an obstacle or they come into some financial difficulty and they decide, oh, it's not for me, I'm going to drop it. Mm-hmm. Or they come across some something that holds them back in some way or something falls through and they, they, they fail to persevere in their offering. And I think when we're making an offering from a, a true place, you know, and sometimes I think too, this is a hesitation of a lot of women who get into wanting to make their offering and they don't have enough positive feedback or positive reinforcement that what they're doing is valuable um they stop offering it yeah and i see that all the time with people they're like oh well it's not working so i'm going to stop doing what i feel draw, drawn to offer mm-hmm. and i think that's a dangerous place because i think when we stop making an offering um we stop putting into the bucket and then and then what we get out isn't really what we wanted either so it's like I think for us to make our offering from a really authentic place and to continue to make that offering Mm -hmm. uh, and to be you know confident in our offering confident of its value I think there's for me personally there's a lot of work in that in making that work and then when it's not immediately reciprocated or say like I have a lull which happens less frequently now than it used to but there's a lull right where all of a sudden my email slows down or I have fewer appointments booked for the week rather than panicking questioning what have I done what am I doing wrong how come this isn't working I think to myself oh I've got more time to play with the kitty cat or I could you know I could go for that walk with a friend I haven't seen in a long time or like there's a little bit of a shift in like how we respond to that like that lull um do you know what I mean by that I do yeah because I think um you know I've seen lots of people too where they they are in that space where they're feeling like they're not going to make it in what they're doing right yeah they're not going to make it they don't feel good about it now. So therefore it's easier to walk away than to figure out why I'm not feeling good about it. And so yeah. having to get yourself back into that um, energy of feeling good about, well, this is what I'm still able to offer. So there are people out there, maybe that person just wasn't the right one, right? And we tend to- It's a reframe. Yeah. yeah, it's a reframe. Yeah. And I felt that when I was teaching yoga because not everyone liked my yoga class. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've taught thousands of yoga class. Not everyone likes my yoga class. And I mean, if I expected everybody to like my yoga class, <laughs> why would I live a disappointing life? You know, or everybody if I expected the same kind of ice cream, I, right? <laughs> yeah. And if I thought I could heal everybody with my plant medicines, you know, that's, it's sort of delusional to think that. So you have to accept that some people who come across you, you're just not for them. Mm-hmm. You know, I recently did a recording for the, uh, for the Canadian herb conference, which is coming up in November. 
And so I got a small presenter presenter spot um, and I did a 20 minute online recorded presentation. And when I looked back at my presentation, I showed it to my partner and to my parents and, and, you know, they all kind of gave me this kind of like, oh, mm -hmm, kind of, yeah. you know, not so sure, kind of not so sure that what I, what I was talking about or what I was doing was this, like, whatever they have in their mind is academic studies or whatever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't fit into their box. They're not really sure what to say. They say, oh, that's really nice. And I think sometimes too, we're surrounded by those people who maybe don't always need our talents or mm -hmm. you know, we have other, I have other dynamics with my partner, my family. I don't need to be a care provider to them. Yes. But my, I think my talk will really appeal to some people mm -hmm. who watch it yeah. and to the rest, you know, they can think whatever they want. And I think that's a huge uh, thing to overcome too. It's like, well, here's my offering. And if you find value in it, great. And if you don't find value in it, Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know? I think one of the best things about being entrepreneurial like this is you get to choose who you get to work with. Right? Yes, you do. Corporate, I didn't really have a choice, but here I get to choose. And so, it, you know, I can sense right away if it's going to be a good fit or not. And so can they. So it's OK to just let them know. I don't know that this is going to work for you or for us together and give yourself the permission to choose who you choose to work with. Um, that's right it's a big part of it it's a big yeah. part of it and it's a it's it, it's a rare thing to find good compatibility you know you have to you have to go uh you have to have a lot of relationships to find the right ones um but I tend to think too that women like us who are drawn to work where we're caring for others or supporting or motivating or inspiring mm -hmm. or or teaching spiritual transformation I tend to think that we are in general a little bit more capable of um molding ourselves towards what other people need or or we have a talent in in, in relational uh, um, arts or something because I do find that most of the clients that come to me do get some benefit out of what I'm doing whether it's counseling with astrology or herbal medicine or um, yoga or meditation or retreating for a few days I think it's everybody kind of takes what they need from it and leaves the rest you know if you don't want it that's okay yeah and not and, for everyone yeah that's what everybody does right so you can um they'll come to you with the right energy but not necessarily are they ready at that time either right they might just be exploring and haven't figured out exactly what they need and so they're still thinking about it and so i think as entrepreneurs it's really important to understand that not everybody is going to show up when you want them but rather when they're ready and that's when we know that we've got that right connection at that particular point in time is when they're really ready to actually work on themselves um, and to be able to help themselves to get whatever it is that they're looking for. And so that's the beauty of the industry that we're in, in my opinion. And, and I think because of the energy and the mindset that we carry, it's easy for us to attract people <laughs> to us because of the way that we are in being able to serve others. But I know also in the coaching that I do, my clients are all just so feel so heard and so supportive yes. with me. And I think the same of yours, your work as well. And I think most people aren't heard these days. <laughs> Nobody's hearing them, right? They're, they're crying, they're shouting, they're, they're saying, I need something different. And it tends to be more of the same that they're hearing back. Oh yeah, well, I'm the same way. And, and so on. And so it right. just, that <laughs> negative reinforcement right? happens. Gross. <laughs> totally. And I think that's the same is true. Like with herbal medicine, like if someone comes to see me and you know, they don't have a healthy diet and they're not putting nourishing things in their body and everyone around them is eating the same way I mean it's going to be much more difficult to reach them with the plant medicine than for somebody who's coming in with a fairly clean diet and mm -hmm. an open willingness to like change certain things about themselves and so yeah I think that's absolutely true that it depends on it depends on how their how their environment is around them as well like what mm -hmm. our environments are like and that's a really huge mission to change our environment, our culture, even. Yeah. Well, you, right? you talk a lot about community in your your business, right? And wanting to build that community. Yeah. Each person is helping to build it one step bigger, one step bigger, and, and embracing more people in the community with that like mindset, that like um, health 
right? That like my like desire to be able to create a healthier life. And, and then you think about that one person that you're touching, but how many are they touching? Right? How are their children changing? Are their friends changing? It's a mandala. Yeah. It's a mandala. So yeah. And I don't know the ripple. And I think sometimes you have to get them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't know the ripple. And I think sometimes we do have to get people out of the culture they live in or out of their environment or away from their job. Or like, that's why I love retreating because you can pluck mm -hmm. somebody out of their environment and put them in a different environment, nourish them with excellent food and something sometimes clicks, you know, you give them something they've never tried before or, they, you know, they're in a different mode or a different way of thinking just for a brief period. That's mm -hmm. why retreats are so amazing and transformational. And they come back to their lives and they see it and they just see it for a second. And then they have this, they have this moment of clarity where they're like, I could change this. I could make this different. I could, you know, start eating this way or, you know, the, and they shift something shifts. Mm -hmm. And then that small change just also starts to trickle into other things. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now tell us about that. your upcoming retreat. Because you're yeah. coming up this month. I do. October 20th, yes, to 23rd. It's on Galliano Island. And we retreat at the North End Community Hall, which is a beautiful little, It's. it reminds me of my studio in that it's just this small hall. It fits 14 uh, yoga mats plus me. And it's a little house in the woods. And it's oh, nice. <laughs> just off the main road. You have to drive all the way from the ferry terminal all the way to the north end of the island. And then there's this little house in the woods and it's warm and cozy and the trees all change color in October and everything is yellow and bright and beautiful and it's cool. And we do yoga and we do sharing circles and we go for hikes in the forest. Um, and it's, uh, three, it's four days and three nights. So we get there Thursday night. And I really think a three night retreat is important. I think sleeping three nights mm. away. Um, there's something about threes. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what, but I think that three nights is very transformational. Um, and then we return to the city on Sunday after breathing in the fresh air. And yeah. And so, um, yeah, I still have spots left. If you want to come, Sally, come. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's from my girlfriend. She just got back from yeah. visit, doing a convention. So I'm going to see if she wants to come with me. But yeah, yeah. so that's... Um, so make sure I'll post up the link to that retreat as well so that yeah it's unity retreats everything I do is unity unity herbals unity retreats unity yoga <laughs> there you go that's awesome it's uh, easy for us but yeah we'll I know for sure in, in uh, all of our communication as well so you know where to find Sue and to get to Thank her retreat you. and if you haven't been to the island you will love it it's just the beauty and the ocean around you and the forests and just the nature, being back in nature. And there's some beautiful places to stay on the island as well. So that Yeah, one. I do have a house there as well. So I invite everyone over to my home on the Saturday night to do a potluck and it's a really nice place. So I always invite people to my home. I have a small home there. So we're working on kind of bridging the gap to get over there more. But at the moment, I'm in Vancouver because Vancouver is where I am. But yes, awesome. eventually. I'll end okay. up there, I hope. <laughs> well, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you today. Is there anything else that you would like to add to um, what you're able to offer or what you're seeing as far as a light bulb moment for people? Um, maybe I think just uh, to live in harmony with nature mm -hmm. is really one of the things that I have adhered to over and over and over. And that means when it gets dark, you go to sleep. And when the light comes up, you get up and to just really look around at your natural environment and know that it's there to support you and to not be afraid of it. I mean, some people I think are a little afraid of the herbs that I give. And, you know, I even talked to someone who said they're afraid to, you know, eat the lemon balm from their garden and afraid to take from directly from the earth. And I think our culture has really separated us from nature. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Sally, you with all of your intuition and your understanding and your connectedness I think it comes down to it comes down to our bond with nature maybe our bond with something greater than ourselves our bond with the earth and the planet and and that all the things I do are rooted in that oh, mm -hmm. awesome. well, it's and and to one another and we're all connected yeah I mean that connection is the, mm -hmm. the why we do what we do is for connection and to be able to, to like you said earlier to serve others in their health their wellness and in their journey in life and hopefully make it a little brighter for them, a little more ease. Right. Um, and there are solutions out there. 
both from what Sue offers and what I offer, um, we all align. And that's why we connected so quickly <laughs> when we met the other day was just because our mindset. So met. quickly. Yeah. Like a little fire. <laughs> it was so much fun. I love it when I meet people like you. Yeah. <laughs> it's so easy to connect because the energy is so strong. Yeah. So I really appreciate you coming on today and I'll leave with this tagline, which is mine. Life is a story and make yours a bestseller. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I look forward thank to you seeing you at so your much, retreat. Sally. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye.